All right, welcome back everyone to the Northern Wolves podcast. This is episode number four, the finale of our series on the book End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke. Now without further ado, let's jump right back in. Last week we left off at the end of chapter six, and now we're moving on to chapter seven, which begins with everybody's favorite subject, the thing that drives people to do what they do during their day, the 40-hour work week, the green, the, the paper chasing, economics. Economics is the study of the trade of work. The principles of money are scientific, and as with all truths, simple and easy to understand. Government institutions have created artificial ideas such as employee, corporation, and dollar to enable them to control your labor. Their objective is to confuse you and make money complex so that they can more easily take it from you. Work. Everything you do to better your life requires work. It may be as simple as planting a seed and tending the soil so that it will grow to be your food. So, yeah, with economics and the degradation of the financial system over time, moving off the gold standard, moving away from real value, everything requires work. But in, our, in today's economics, we'll just print more. When they print more, it devalues your work. So socialists ignore this law of effort, and a way to rob you is taxation, a way to reward the non-working, and then the hidden tax of inflation. Prices keep going up. It's not because there's less of things. Maybe there is an element of that. But it's because there's more money flooded into the environment, into the economic environment. So everything costs more. Because there's more money going around, so money loses its value. It doesn't gain value. When you print money, it doesn't just keep the same value. It, it loses money. Reference Atlas Shrugged as an end product of democracy and socialism, or just look around and open up the news. In regards to work, nobody can evolve you. You must put in work. Imagine a tree looking up and asking the other trees to help it grow. You can lend a hand, but ultimately it is up to the individual and their work ethic to make something of themselves. This goes for any endeavor, spiritual, physical, arts, talent, sports. Nothing happens through talent alone. It, everything worth gaining and growing to achieve requires hard work. You can even see this demonized in the, uh, the Bible, in Genesis, of all things, 319. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now it's complete inversion. Everything in this life takes work, whether it's physical labor, um, you know, talents, art, spirituality, spiritual growth. It all takes work. Labors, labors of the mind, labors of the body, right? You can see, uh, like you said, this, the socialists uh, ignore that law of effort that, you know, everybody should just have everything equally. You know, this guy is going to work 10 times as hard as this person, but you know what? Or whatever. Everybody could just do the same, right? Communism, just like that. You know, spread the wealth through everybody. Everybody owns the, uh, the products of the labor. Yeah. And these utopian visions are sold back to us because people, you know, laying in their uh, stupor and laying in their conditions, which again, it's, it's individual, but it's also this outward pressure to make them into those um, decrepit states. They look around their environment and then they fantasize about a utopian world, right? All these ideas are sold on, on bettering humanity in this uh, quote unquote golden age and everything will be taken care of and we'll all live in peace and harmony. But I, I do think that that is a, uh, it's projected from an infantile mind. It's, it's not wanting to progress through work. It's wanting to regress back into childhood. So rather than grow and, and grow through work and, your own efforts, just let's everybody just help each other. And uh, the government will, you know, we'll, everything will just be taken care of. We'll live in bliss. The, we'll return back to the Garden of Eden and it's regression. It's, it's wanting to regress back to that state of childhood. It's pure laziness. Yeah. The government's going to give you everything. So why do I have to work? Why should I grow my own vegetables? Why should I grow my own cannabis? Why should I, uh, you know, still my own alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten to a point where if I want to do something, whether it's detriment, detrimental to my health or not, I'm going to make sure that I want to do it myself. Yeah. Growing my own tobacco, deciding to smoke um, organic 
non-pesticide, you know, all these things. I'm not saying smoke, do whatever you want against your body, but vegetables when I can. Canada has a horrible growing season, but I blossom where I'm planted. And I understand, you know, the sweat of my brow is the bread I'll eat. That's to- I'm, to- I'm completely fine with that. I would much rather eat things that I've seen from seed to bearing fruit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not there in my life yet, but that's one of the goals. Absolutely. It's all progression, right? You know, I think, I think a lot of this comes back to we were stripped from nature. I'm not saying let's go back to the forest and let's go be bushmen. When your survival depends on you going out and hunting every day, you can't just push the button and order Uber Eats. I used that quite a bit in the past. You can't just go to the grocery store. Like You actually need to go and exert the effort. It's almost been made too easy. Everything is, is too easy to just be apathetic and lazy. If you don't want to work, just you know, fill out a form. I got a mental illness. Here's my government check. You can play Call of Duty all day. The utopian vision that socialism sells is very childlike. It's ignoring the principle of work. Money. Money is a record of all savings and debt transactions. All it does is record what you owe or what is owed to you. It can be carried symbolically as paper or coin or as a line item on accounting books. After you have performed some of your work in trade, you receive money to record the value of that work. Your trade of work can be between any number of people and all redeemed at different times. The principle of money greatly enables people and frees them to work and receive the benefits of their own schedules. Economic control. There are people who wish to use your work for their own purposes without providing anything in return. The objective of economic control is to control as much of your labor as possible. Tax. There is an extra party to most economic trades that take place on earth. They offer no benefit to either party and they do not allow you to choose whether or not to include them in the trade. A tax is when someone takes money that does not belong to them. Taxes are law and not principle because they destroy freedom and must be enforced. Some of the people who tax are common thieves while others are powerful governments. Taxation is theft, period. There's a lot of a lot of information on this. We don't have all day to get into it, but you're also funding your own slavery, especially how corrupted these governments are, and uh, they've gotten out of hand. It's race to the bottom economics as money floods the system and loses value. Humans lose integrity, and unethical ways to make money rises. So as there's more money, the money loses value. And since money loses value, your time loses value as well. In the past, people could have just owned a shop or, or, or done a trade and taken care of their entire family. Now, now it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that. And so people, young, naive people that were not, again, it's coming back to parenting, that were not raised properly. They have no proper heroes. They don't have the proper mythology within their, within their system. They don't know. They're just lost at sea, essentially. They look out and say, look, I'm not, why would I go and work an honest job? Why would I enter the workforce? Why would I go you know, even getting a job at uh, McDonald's or Wendy's when I could just open up an OnlyFans account or I can just do some corrupt activities. Why, why even, why bother? I'm not doing that. I can make millions doing unethical things. And that's devaluing money as well. So it says race to the bottom as the financial system gets more corrupt. It's a reflection on the people becoming more corrupt and people losing value in themselves. This is all symptomatic. It's all connected. A little bit off topic on tax, but tax is one way to strip the value from people. Another way is inflation. Fundamentally, you are funding your own slavery, man. Mm. And a lot of people have figured this out. And um, this is not a study session into how to do tax evasion, anything like that. That's something you need to figure out on your own. Take that responsibility upon yourself to figure out what, uh, what these taxes are paying for, what, where that money's going, your hard earned money. What is it doing to others? Because if you're hurting yeah. people by proxy, there's some karmic debt there. Yeah. That's a huge one that people don't even think about. They push it into the back of their minds thinking, whatever, they're, they know best. They can take my money and put it wherever they want. You have no say where that goes. And if you mm-hmm. think so, you're fooling yourself. Whether voting, anything, it's, it's all bullshit. You do not have a single say where that money goes. Yeah. So it goes into the next quote that James is going to read. This guy, his name's Larkin Rose, and uh, he's gone through 
this exact thing. And I would suggest looking up his YouTube channel, Larkin Rose, reading his book um, and what he went through because he fundamentally knows he no, he no longer wanted to fund his own slavery and he wanted mm-hmm. no part of it because he knew taxation is theft. Yeah. <clears throat> Before I read that, I just going back to the inflation, inflation is that hidden tax. So that it, it is related. Uh, so I'm going to read this quote from Larkin Rose. Highly recommend going to his YouTube channel, checking out his books. This will lay very proper foundations on the financial system. Property taxes rank right up there with income taxes in terms of immorality and destructiveness. Where income taxes are simply slavery using different words, property taxes are just a mafia turf racket using different words. For the former, if you earn a living on the gang's turf, they extort you. For the latter, if you own property in their territory, they extort you. The fact that most people still imagine both still imagine both to be legitimate and acceptable shows just how powerful authoritarian indoctrination is. Meanwhile, even a brief objective examination of the concepts should make anyone see the lunacy of it. Wait, so every time I produce anything or trade with anyone, I have to give a cut to the local crime lord. Wait, so I have to keep paying every year for the privilege of keeping the property I already finished paying for. And not only do most people not make such obvious observations, but if they hear someone else pointing out such things, the well-trained Stockholm Syndrome slaves usually make arguments condoning their own victimization. Thus is the power of the mind control that comes from repeated exposure to BS political mythology and propaganda. It's just been ingrained. People, it's just common sense. You've got to pay your taxes. Well, inflation, well, we got to print money. There's a coronavirus. It's just, it, it's insanity. So money loses its value. When money loses its value, people lose their value and they start doing ethic, unethical and immoral things to to gain it. They start reaching outside of, of actually doing things that are worthwhile. And then you see this, you see this everywhere. You see the flood of all these online businesses and everything's just cheaply manufactured. You know, a craft maker could have taken, you know, a year to build a birdhouse or something like that and, and got top dollar for it and his pride and joy, hand carved, hand graven. Now you just have a 3D printer. You just have somebody in a Chinese sweatshop, which is atrocious to to think that that's actually occurring. These phones that we use, it's all just, these are slaves building it. And then it's it's rushed to over here. We use it. Everything is losing its value, including our time. And then it's a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom where people are, nobody, to do things of value takes time. It takes work. And since nobody, you know, nobody's getting paid for what they're actually worth, well, to survive, I'm going to have to go, uh, you know, sell some drugs or whatever. Go on OnlyFans. Extortion. The corruption of economics is called extortion. When you labor, but someone else redeems your work without your permission, it is tax. To tax someone is to steal from them a portion of their work, or all of it. Under taxation, you work, but gain nothing in return. Even when the claim is made that the money will be spent for your benefit, you cannot choose what your work will buy. Under taxation, the extortionist is the master and you are the slave. What amount of time they steal from you is irrelevant. A slave for an hour or slave for life is still a slave. Failure to pay is penalized by imprisonment or death. Because taxation is a function of time, they can pirate from you not just huge percentages of your money today and not just the rest of your life, but all possibility of interest on your labors. Government taxation is the single most effective extortion racket that has ever existed. The evil genius comes with the culture. Most citizens consider it honorable to pay their masters. Earn, trade, save. Taxation is obfuscated in every area of life. The easiest to see is when they take your money as you earn it. Income tax, regulations, and governmental restrictions allow the extortionist to pirate labor before you ever get to put it to your use. You serve them. They leave you the scraps. Whatever the percentage of your liberty or labors, they allow. Extortionists take a further percentage every time you trade your labor, called sales tax, use tax, gas tax, or any such sundry names. You have less than you produced because they already took huge percentages from you. And now as you go to redeem your labor for food, shelter, better health or comforts, they take even more. This is not all because they also restrict your choices in redemption. They tell you what is legal to buy, how much, and sometimes at what price. One thing I really 
wish he would have added would have been the death tax because in the last few years I've heard a you know a couple people their family members died parents whatever anything like that and that money if it's not specifically put in a right account I can't tell you which one it is they tax at least fifty percent of those savings to yeah, even just be transferred tax. right they call it the death tax if they're going to tax you even after you're dead that is insidious yep it's insane you think of generational wealth and you have children you want to pass on what you've done so when you die that they can you know you, you you ensure a better future for your bloodline you ensure a better future for for your loved ones and then when you die you're taxed so right out let's say you start with a million dollars in savings when you die 500 grand okay that's passed on but now there's inflation on top of that so that 500 grand is now worth 250 grand and then let's say you you pass away and that's cut in half again it's cut in half again it's just like this it's always cutting it in half i did the math on this over about 10 generations this inheritance tax completely wipes out any wealth that was accumulated and then look at what they're doing with the farmers in the, the netherlands this, you know this goes on in canada it's this is a global operation of complete control and now there's always ways to get around things right? This is not financial advice. This is uh do your own research type conversation, right? Um, precious metals, there's peer to peer electronic things, right? That I'm going to add, it's, it's all up to you. You figure out what, what needs to be done to secure your wealth, the product of your labor, you know, generational wealth for your children, grandchildren, whatever it needs to be. Now this could just be, Hey, buying $10,000 worth of seeds. What, you know what I mean? I'm just throwing things out there. You have, Mm -hmm. you as a sovereign being need to figure out how you're getting fucked by the government and figure out how to fix it. Yeah. Because nobody else is going to come around and do it for you. Nobody's going to come take a look at your portfolio or your savings account and be like, you need to do this, 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 and this. That's not going to (laughs) happen. You know, maybe if you have enough money, you can bring it to an accountant and they can be, Hey, maybe that whatever. Right. But it's your responsibility. Yeah. Especially starting out. At, at rock bottom, you know, thrown out into the world. It's very tough. It's it's tough to own a home now. It's tough to to raise a family. This is all by design. Men and women, women shouldn't be in the workforce. They should be at home taking care of children. But now both are required to go and work. Look at this is tax. This is inflation. It comes back to the kids. Now those kids aren't properly being raised. And then those kids are thrown out into the same world and, you know, go to university and get whatever. And then you're thrown out into the workforce and to get ahead in life is very, very difficult. So you need to figure out alternative ways to secure yourself. Because if you follow the script that's been given to you by this corrupted society, you're not going to get very far. You're going to get, you're going to get fucked actually. And now even uh, bringing it back to 2020 again, anybody who followed along, followed suit, closed their businesses, put up the signs, enforced mask mandates, anything like that. A lot of them, a lot of the businesses right now are doing horribly. They closed down. How long do you think it would have lasted? Now you can take a look at the ones who didn't and said, no, there are not too many out there, but they're doing well. They're doing very well because a lot of people were like, we didn't get hassled for three fucking years straight. Didn't have to go through fights just to get a piece of hardware, whatever, groceries, you know, a shoe, anything like whatever the necessity was at that time, they weren't getting hassled. They weren't getting messed with. So they understood mm-hmm. that those people were like, no, we're going to run our business our way. This is our business. This is not the government's business. Mm-hmm. And then look at the people that were in major corporations or different industries. They brought out that mandatory vaccine. So you, you followed the rules all along and then you put yourself in a position. The reins of your life are in somebody else's hands and uh, telling you your livelihood now depends on complying. A lot of them did. And the joke is you didn't even have to do it. Yeah. Look at it now. It's like swept under the rug. People, they're not even talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, that's why it's very important to become self-sufficient in baby steps, figure out a way to become self-employed, figure out a way to generate income in ethical ways, secure your land. These are processes that I'm not completed, but that's the direction that I want to go so that you have as much control over your life as necessary to avoid these situations that were people, people were forced into. Said, if you don't do this, you lose your job. Well, if you lose your job, you can't take care of the kids now. It's sad. It's sad what happened. But, but if everybody collectively just said no, then it would have stopped. But see, here's the thing. People... Their minds were controlled. People could say, why didn't everybody just say no? 
It's because, no, they wanted that. Again, we're coming back to the psychology aspect of it. They wanted that control. They wanted the dictatorship. They wanted the vaccine. People look at the lineups. Even still today, people are doing it. Such a mundane life. They manifested a, uh, a need for a crisis. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's, I think there's studies that say people miss, miss those days because finally they, you know, they felt alive. They've been bored their whole life. And then all of a sudden there's a quote unquote pandemic and wow, wow, like something exciting is going on. Stay home, stay safe. <laughs> Never want to hear that again. We're on to cartels and monopolies. Government is the only true monopoly. You cannot choose whether or not to buy their services. Opting out is called treason and tax evasion. An authority will come to your door with guns. They will imprison or kill you. Yeah. Fact. Yeah. Anything that says you must do this is attempting to enslave you. Period, period, period. It is that simple. The choice is always yours. We are free to act, but not free from its consequences. So, you know, the government comes along and says you must do this. There's options where you don't have to. You may face certain consequences, though. It's better to die as a free man than live as a slave. Live as a slave. There's always that option. There's always that option of self defense, and you have the absolute right of self defense. Somebody comes knocking. Well, there's self defense is your right. And it's funny you can see how they slip their tentacles into uh, making the word monopoly a bad thing when, in fact, they are. It's the only true monopoly, right? You cannot choose whether or not to pay taxes or you know, do anything the government really tells you. So you can see in the States, there was a company called Ma Bell, right? It was such a large company. I won't get too deep into it, but it was a large company about like uh, telecommunications, right? Yeah. I think that's where Bell came from. Anyways, it was called Ma Bell and everybody had Ma Bell and they eventually passed a law saying we're going to, you know, the monopoly is too big. People have to have a choice. And this is in America. That's why you see in the States, people have infinite amount of, you know, phone companies to go to where it's super cheap. Now here in Canada, they did it a little bit more sloppy and lazy. There's really only two companies when it comes to telecommunications. And they both in their own respect are, or I guess disrespect, um, monopolies. It's Rogers and Bell. So they gave you, and they're, it's funny, it's blue and red, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it is. I never noticed that, yeah. Blue and red, two companies, right? I mean, there's other ones that are small, but they're, again, they're using the same communication devices and the same towers as Rogers and Bell. They own Canada. They're both shit. They're both highly expensive, but they made it so the monopoly was you have two choices, red or blue. Sounds familiar, no? Mm. Conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, same thing. So they will tell you monopolies are bad. They will say you can't have that. There has to be free choice, uh, multiple, you know, vast choices for people. And then they come in and say, well, fuck, you can't pay your taxes or we're going to shoot you and or put you in prison. So you can see that kind of that, that switch. Yeah. Yeah. Which gets us into choice. An important principle to understand is that evil wants power over you. Money is only a representation of work. And as long as evil people can compel you to work on their behalf, they don't need to possess money to control you. This principle is exercised in welfare and socialist states. Money confiscated by politicians is largely not spent directly on themselves. However, it will still enjoy the taste of power over you by taking and spending that which they did not earn. It is not money that is evil, but slavery. For all who wish to feed the poor of the world, there is only one solution. End authority. Freedom solves the world's ills. The reason the earth has widespread poverty is simply because people are not free to pursue prosperity. A free people are prosperous, prosperous people. Government debt. Government debt is money spent by governments before they confiscate it. Such debt has little meaning since the evil is found in the confiscation and not the timing. However, given the culture of democracies, people are taught the nobility of nations and the loyalty of being a taxpayer. Governments know that they can spend whatever they want today and obligate you to pay for it tomorrow. Yeah, the, the debt-based economic model. There is a lot of resources out there. Creature from Jekyll Island, I never read the book myself. The problem is not a lot of people know how the central banks work. That is the problem. So it's designed for hyperinflation. People are not aware of how it works. So when it does implode, 
This has happened throughout history. It's happened in modernity, uh, Venezuela, other countries where their money is devalued to the point where it's meaningless. And then people, it's always the people, the citizens on the ground level take the brunt of it. So people give their rights away for more safety. And then the pattern repeats. So once the dollar collapses, usually dictatorships erect or there's socialism, which becomes dictatorship. And then the dollar collapses. This happened in Venezuela. Uh, I'm sure there's other examples as well. But the debt-based model is essentially, the dollar's not back to anything real. It's just printed printed out of thin air. So the way it works is, say I'm, I'm the central bank and I'm lending to you, Andrew. No, thank you. <laughs> but I'm going <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give you a dollar but tomorrow you have to pay me back 2 dollars. Does that sound okay? That sounds fucking No. No. Well, that, I'm going to hold a gun now and say I'm going to give you a dollar and tomorrow you're going to give me back 2 cuz this is essentially how it works. Pretty much. They, they do this. Yeah. So tomorrow comes along and there's only a dollar printed but now all of a sudden you owe me 2 dollars to pay back the debt. So I say that's fine. I'll give you $2 so you can pay back the debt, but tomorrow you have to pay me back 4 The next day it goes around. Okay, now we're up to, I'm going to give you $8. Tomorrow just pay me back 16 And then it's just this cycle where there's more debt than there actually is units of actual currency. There's more debt in the world than there is the money to pay back the debt. This is how our financial system operates. It's absolutely ludicrous. It's insane. People are chasing around Fiat notes that mean nothing. And every year it just it buys you less and less as they print more, as the debt increases. Even today, I, I haven't paid too much attention to it, but the debt ceiling and all this stuff, and we're gonna do this and save the economy, and it's it's gonna eventually implode upon itself. I and think it was Jordan people, Maxwell. Yeah. Sorry, man. I think it was Jordan Maxwell or um one of these economists that have kind of woken up. They basically said all money now is debt. That if all debt yeah. were to go away, there would be absolutely no money because money mm-hmm. is debt. So that's, you can see the game being played where there actually is no money, doesn't exist. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And fractional reserve lending. So the, the central banks loan out a dollar to the regional banks. And then the, the regional banks, they take $1 and then they can fractionally, they can make from $1, they can make $100. Then they lend it to people, and then it's just like this this giant octopus tentacle creature. Yeah. So you know we still have that to deal with. in In the coming years, this is going to be the topic of conversation. Now you're seeing bricks, and you're seeing other economic models placed forward. I tend to not even pay attention to this bullshit anymore, but it's still going to affect us. It's going to affect everybody around us. Bureaucracy. The law teaches that you must comply with reams of bureaucracy and enforcement in order to protect other people from you. You are taught that you must comply with extensive enforcement because you cannot be trusted to live peacefully, while culture teaches that the nature of criminality is murder, rape, and theft. Almost none of the enforcement of law has anything to do with such things. The reason is obvious. You are not evil. You do not do such heinous things. There is very little reason to believe that those around you are any less moral than you. And yet, somehow, support that basic definition of crime, millions are employed as agents of law. They spend all their time making sure you comply with the facets and iotas of every regulation they can devise. Yeah. You know, bureaucracy, these governments keep getting bigger, bigger. I think there's a stat in Canada, I don't know what it is, like 30 or 40 percent are employed by the federal government. You know, well, the private sector keeps getting smaller and smaller. Where do you think the value comes from? The value comes from individuals in the private sector. Governments, they don't create anything. They just destroy. They just, they look for jobs. They hire nonsense, you know, these bureaucracies. It's, it's like a parasite growing and growing. While the host, which is you, the private sector, the individual that has his own hopes and dreams gets drained. On the human level, it is not the government, but the money printers, the Vatican, etc., that pull the most weight. Then the essence of evil thins down. It stretches back into satanic cults, which is stretches into black magic, astral entities, dark sorcery, and further into alien entities. So what you're seeing on the government level, these are just meat puppets. Governments, government agents are meat puppets, low-level agents of, of control in terms of bureaucracy. 
It's diffusion of power. It's not just the prime minister. It's not just the president or the elected officials. It's your neighbor who works for the licensing bureau. It's your uncle that does tax reports for companies. It's It spreads to almost everybody where it becomes such a, a fact of life. And it's not just people even just working for the government. It's people complying to it as well. It just becomes such a fact of life, this, this overreaching parasite. A lot of these jobs shouldn't even exist. They don't add value. They take value. That's what, that's what these governments do. That's what parasites do. They don't add anything. They take. You can see there was uh, the same place the trucker convoy protested. The agents of the CRA, that's the Canadian Revenue Agency, went on a strike. They wanted, I don't know, like 20, 30% wage hike, something like that, some nonsense bullshit. And nobody was there. Not a single person was there cheering with them, saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They were on the picket line. And there was actually an article that came out that said um, something of the nature of people aren't supporting the CRA. Wonder why. And they, they say, like, why? Clearly, people know, like, this is the issue is people understand taxes as, are, are theft, essentially. People don't want to pay them. Nobody would, in their right mind, pay the taxes that they do if they had a choice. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, there might be a few out there, but like the vast Ned majority Flanders. of people wouldn't. Yeah, you're, you're Ned Flanders, right? So you can see, man, it, it's, they are parasitic and people know this, right? They're not going to support, but that's where they leave it. They're not putting anything into action. So I just want to bring that up. It was funny because even the own government, the CBC, you know, government owned media was like, people aren't supporting the CRA agents. It was really funny. Yeah. I wonder why, right? Education. Governments control education for the purpose of culturing employees. The objective of state education is the stabilization of the tax base. Schooling, education, and knowledge are not the same thing. One is not a natural result of the other. People grow in knowledge when they learn truths. Teaching and schooling are meaningless when students do not seek wisdom. They are likewise meaningless when that which is being taught is not wisdom. In order to learn, people must thirst for knowledge. Force and compulsion cannot accomplish this. Law does not pretend to teach people their worth or abilities of achievement. Law desires only that you learn obedience. Not only does law provide a way for students to learn the merits of social and economic obedience to authority, it enforces a near-perfect monopolization against all other teachers. Private schools and parents themselves are nearly shut out from the teaching children the one lesson they need, an understanding of their own value and potential. When people understand that their minds are truly capable of anything, that they are able to learn and grow according to their dreams, they tend to make poor citizens. They question culture and oppressive authority. They reject taxation. They are stronger, more peaceful, more prosperous, and more independent. All of this is wonderful for humanity and destroys evil. That's what these education systems were for. They weren't to teach you. They were to teach you how to be a compliant slave, to grow the tax base. If you're using just the the surface level of things, grow this tax base, you know, reward compliance and, and fill the heads with a bunch of shit. That's what education is in its common form. And, and now especially a lot of these teachers are absolute nutcases. They're, they're masking your children. They have purple-haired dinosaur-looking lesbians, <laughs> like all this rainbow stuff. And, it just, and you're, you're sending your children to that now. It's, it's absolute insanity. You're in... Indo- <laughs> That's what education has become. You're sending your children into the arms of the enemy. And it's not it's it's overt now. It's it used to be covert. I remember school, you know, you'd learn some stuff, you'd learn some socialization. Of course, schooling and education is not bad, but it, again, it's been hijacked. Of of course you need education, uh, you know. And then people get you take it to the extremes and no more schools and and all this stuff. No, we we still need to teach children. But it's just, what are you teaching the children? Who is teaching the children? You can see the correlation between what a high school or grade school looks like versus what a state penitentiary looks like, a jail. There's not much difference. Not much difference at all. Now, even back, I'd say 50s and 60s, 
you can work in a factory, have a family, two kids, brand new car, a uh, vacation home or a cottage, and it would all be paid for by working in a factory. Start time, whistle goes off. Do your work for a certain amount of hours, whistle goes off. Have your lunch, whistle goes off. You go back to work for a certain amount of time, whistle goes off. Maybe you have a break or recess. And then the final bell and you go home. And you do that all throughout the week. So you can see that they were training. And this was to keep the tax base going. This was to further the government structure, civilization, society, whatever you want to call it, to keep it going, keep it moving. Factory workers, this was coming out of World War II, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see that correlation of it was just training people to be good employees. Now, you can go back even further and there's Rudolf Steiner um, schools, right? Where, where they're teaching children. I mean, they would learn nine different languages by the time they were adults. Wow. They understood arithmetic. They understood mathematics. They understood astrology. They had the fundamentals of Greek mythology, right? That is knowledge. Mm-hmm. That's, that to me is education. That's not schooling. No, no, so exactly. The past, yeah, the huge fall from uh, Montessori, I think it was. A Steiner Montessori or something like that. It was, yeah, huge fall. Yeah, Steiner's another one I have to look into. And and think about what that's doing. I don't know about you, but I remember sitting in those classrooms, the stuffy air, looking at that blasted clock and just fidgeting. Like, you know, I couldn't even I couldn't even sit still. I think probably some ADD absolutely going on there. But th- that's that that that's that vital energy. The kid does it. Every kid hated school. Well, that tells you something. School break, it's, it's over. The bell rings, summer school. But th- that conditioning carries on into adult life. So you, you go to your job. It's Monday to Friday. Yeah, we, we just got cut off there. But I was going on about the school system. So what, is it, what does that teach you? That Monday to Friday, you have to sit and, and suppress yourself. Sit in that chair and suppress you know, all the instincts that are saying, I want to go. I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. I want to be doing what I want. You're suppressing, you're suppressing your essence. And then the bell rings, and then you boom, 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 out to play. This continues on through adult life, and and then people. That's where people pick up addictions to deal with. They're not expressing their soul. They're not expressing their self. They're not in selfhood. They're at their job, fidgeting at the office. And then Friday comes around. Friday, fuck yeah, Friday's here. Let's get wasted. Let's take some drugs because you've you've spent. Five days suppressing yourself, going into misery, going, you know, drudging yourself to that office, doing something that you hate. And then when finally that clock lets you free, you're not balanced. So then you need to really free yourself. And, and that's where, you know, alcoholism. And, but this is all starts in early childhood, sitting in that hellish, hellish landscape of the school system. And it's just gotten worse. Hellish land, uh, masking your children, putting, ja- you know, giving, Giving your children into the hands of Jabberwockies, masked up and teaching you the inversions of natural principles. How do you think those kids are going to turn out? We have to stop sending kids to these freaks. We need to reinvent the entire school system, homeschooling. And, and they even in, in, in pass laws now that say, oh, if you, you have to send your, you, the curriculum is this. How will parents just say, fuck you, here's my curriculum? Or get together and discover what a true curriculum should look like, like a Rudolf Steiner, like you're talking about, and say, this is what we're doing. You can go see this finger. You can just, you know what it means. But the parents don't know any better because they were indoctrinated. It's a generational indoctrination to create. It's a schizophrenic slave class. Ah. I just don't think enough people are doing it because there are a few people I follow on Twitter that that's what they did. That's what they, they said did. enough was enough and they took their children out of these fucking indoctrination camps and they took that burden. I don't, I don't want to call it a burden. I mean, we should be teaching our own children, right? But with, you know, 40 to 50, 60 hour work weeks, how, how do you get it done? Right. You have to do it. So they did yeah. that. And I have absolute respect for these people. A lot of moms mostly is what I saw. They, uh, mm-hmm. they took their kids right out of school and they started teaching, teaching homeschool. Yeah. It's, it's a big process that we're in. It's going to call for big solutions. It's going to take generations. The pattern of tyranny has repeated itself throughout history. It cycles in every instance of evil, large and small. The pattern of liberty, however, is a singular flow that has been progressing slowly since the beginning of time. 
Yeah, these cycles, uh, they come and go. Perhaps it's all just written in the stars, the yuga cycles, processional cycles, saying that freedom and liberty has only increased. It's, it's arguable. Evidence shows that slavery has only gone covert and underground, that our ancestors were in fact more free. This is a topic for another time, but uh, you know, look into pagan Europe before pre-Christian Europe. Our ancestors were more connected to nature, arguably more free, free to express themselves and evolve properly. But here we are on the on the cusp of an attempted global enslavement system. But we can say for certain that evil cannot win. Freedom will always prevail. Evil, again, back to the Tessarian quote, evil contains the seeds of its own destruction. It may have its reign of terror, but it takes your participation in it. If people opt out, if people understand these true principles, it has no no jurisdiction. It has no power over you because you've cleaned your inner temple. It has no power over you internally. Therefore, the external has no power over you either. So this is this is uh, this progresses through history. The progress through history. The pattern of liberty tracks the destruction of ideas and empires through history. It also tracks the progress of principles and technology. And this comes back to the idea that technology is neutral. We were talking about that. You can say that, uh, I mean, look at, we're choosing to use the internet to spread ideas, raise awareness, kind of all tools are neutral. It's how, it's how they're used. And there are, in this book, he talks about two tools, which the first one, obviously there's more, but in this book, he mentions gunpowder. One of the defining technologies that dramatically altered the scope of culture was gunpowder. Prior to its availability, only those who could amass strong armies could effectively defend their land and families. This meant that people were heavily at the mercy of governments and kings. Once gunpowder became available, even small bands of families could challenge the mighty castles of empires. Gunpowder reshaped the kingdoms of earth by empowering people to challenge the violent control employed by the lords of war. Yeah, you can really see the decline of a society right after they seize control of private guns, private gun ownership. It's uh it's a playbook. Happened in Adolf Hitler's Germany, happened in basically every communist regime that ever existed. Once the guns were gone, that's it. Total control. Mm-hmm. You're at now at the mercy of this lord of war, these warlords, right? So if you choose not to defend yourself that's a major problem it could be anything there could be a a predator whether it's human or animalistic right you need to be able to defend yourself in any which way you can and if a government starts telling you you cannot do that you can't have weapons there's a problem for them because you should be amassing more and not to say go out and you know start shooting people that's it that's not at all what we're saying it's just about having the ability to defend yourself because anything can happen in this world. Now, and, again, it has coming, happened. Absolutely. Just look back in history. Mm-hmm. So coming from the, uh, the biker world that I was in for a very long time, even beforehand, I always held a knife and I learned the laws of Canada where you're allowed to carry a pocket knife on the outside. It can't physically be concealed. So if you wanted, you can walk around with a katana or a Japanese samurai sword as long as it wasn't concealed because then they can start using the bureaucracy and all this nonsense to call it a concealed weapon. So I held a knife on my belt every day of my life, no matter where I went. And it wasn't to inflict fear and terror in people's eyes. Now, mind you, having people see it and realize, hey, maybe I shouldn't talk to that guy. That was great. But it was for me because I understood the law. I understood the ability to defend myself at any point if anything were to happen. And when I was confronted about it, all I had to do was tell them, go cite the law. You're the one now claiming, you're the claimant, right? You're you're claiming that I'm not allowed to have this. It's now your duty to go prove that. All I would do is go read your own laws. Never once was I ever, ever put in handcuffs for having a military style K-bar on my side. Still to this day, it's on me all the time. It's a tool. It's a multi, that's the neutrality of tools is that knife can be used to sever an artery or a seatbelt in a crash. Mm -hmm. It's how it's being used. The same can be said about power. Power is neutral. It's about how it's applied, the intent behind it. So on the subject of gunpowder, 
understand your laws, understand what you can and cannot have. And now, I mean, there are ways around it. Like you mentioned a 3D printer before, but we won't get into that right now. The printing press. The printing press was the foundation of all technology, whereas mathematics and engineering have existed in strength in different areas in history. They never survived. War destroyed the information learned. After the printing press, so many copies of books could be maintained that human knowledge persisted in writing and spread as fast as a thirst for a demand. Yeah. And now look at the printing press. It's a digital printing press. It's the, the amount of knowledge available now is unparalleled. Almost any book that you want, you can have delivered to your door or the digital version almost instantaneously. If you're not reading books that were banned by the uh, Vatican and in- <laughs> Inquisition back back when that was happening, you're doing something wrong. You should be reading those books and more. The pen, what, what's that? The pen is always mightier than the sword. Yep. Yeah. Because of words, language. Mm-hmm. In Ideas. Lord of the Rings, what is Saruman? What do they say? Don't let him speak. Yeah. Right. The power of the word. The power to change minds is always going to win out over gunpowder. The Great American Experiment. The Great American Experiment was proof for the world. It dared to call the bluff of culture and test what people would do with liberty. Whereas culture had long taught that people were not able or worthy of ruling their own lives. The American Rebellion taught people that they were fully able to live life without a king. They taught by their actions and wittings that men were worth more than governments. This experiment in freedom lived past its first test. As they defeated the armies of King George, the shock that rang through the world was enough to shatter the bonds of the culture of royalty that enslaved Earth for thousands of years. Yeah, when it comes to the American Constitution, the idea of it is great and the the principles of it. Again, a convoluted area of time in history. Yeah. Yeah, because you look into the history of who wrote it, and you know this could be kind of a long game. Um, we'll refer to the the article by Michael Tassarian, the Constitution Con. He get, kind of gets into the history of when it was written. But with all that said, it is still one of the best places to live on Earth. With all that said about it possibly being a deception to begin with, Canada, United States, the Western countries are still the greatest places to live on earth. But we want to keep it that way, right? We want to prevent total tyranny. We're privileged here. We we really much are. But still, things can change quickly. We need to always keep on top of things. And I'm just going to read a quote by Forrest MacDonald. The first function of the founders of nations after the founding itself is to devise a set of true falsehoods about origins a mythology that will make it desirable for, na- for nationals to continue to live under common authority and, indeed, make it impossible for them to entertain contrary thoughts. So this, this whole idea, because what I see now, what I see going on is that Americans are blinded by their own national pride. It continues on even to this day. It's just getting more and more contorted into this QAnon program and and trump and mega people are blinded to the atrocities that the american empire has committed under its name these wars that it started the these criminals these psychopaths they operate under the mask of the american empire they they operate in the background and people just look at the mask of the nation they become so enamored with the pride and you know they refer to the constitution but there's still a lot of uh I mean, the the slavery continues on in the United States, the criminal or the, um, what do you call it, the the prison industrial complex, all the wars, the fake-ass wars, Vietnam. So, with that said, it's still one of the best places on Earth. Internet. The internet and modern computing power have destroyed cultural ignorance once and for all. Like the printing press before it, the internet has made possible the widespread dissemination and near indestructibility of information. The bonds of culture are founded in the control of speech and of the control of the mind. When people are free to speak what they think, people learn wisdom at an astonishing pace. For cultures to succeed, they require imposed ignorance and cultivation of planned thought. As soon as people question the rule of law, authority is lost. Again, a tool. 
right? Again, whoever created these things, I mean, you may not ever really know the complete origin, but it's a tool. Look what we're using it for versus somebody creating scams or, you know, on porn websites 24 hours a day. It's, it's really about how you're using it. Mm -hmm. But he's saying here, the capability is all that matters, right? Like it it was, it was put out, it's game over, right? It's going to be used for good. It's going to be used for evil. It's just a matter of um, your intentions behind it and how many people really realize the, the power behind it. Yep. Massive power behind it. Violence replaces culture. When cultures break down and the authorities they protect are threatened, violence grows. Violence is a necessary component of control. Violent enforcement is necessary to ward off sedition. Violence changes the dynamics by making the cost of freedom death. Yep. From covert to overt violence. Uh, There was a quote that I said on the last podcast about the stages of civilization that it, it collapses due to loose fiscal policy. And then the dictator comes in. Um, so this is, this is the end product of these civilizations. Violence changes the dynamics by making the cost of freedom death. Yeah. We lived through this mandatory vaccines as a modern example. It is a violation, which means violence. You know, we, we went through this. Yeah. You can see it even, uh, you know, you, the trucker convoy in Ottawa, if that would have, if people would have actually, you know, stopped and, uh, or sorry, didn't stop, how violent do you think that would have gotten? It already was pretty violent. I watched that live, right? This is, you can see culture breaking down, right? No longer are we going to sit back and let you inject our children and let, you know, kick us out of a grocery store for not following a mandate, which is not a law, right? You can see this, this breakdown in culture today mm-hmm. and you saw exactly what happened. It was violent. People were yeah. thrown in cars. They were beat up. Now imagine if those people fought back with equal amount of force. It would have been all hell, right? Yeah, it was close to that. that. Yeah. Australia was another example of overt violence. These these lockdowns, what do you think that is? That's violence. You're they're violating you. They're violating. It's that's what violence is. Somebody coming along and saying you're not free to do this anymore. That's a violation of your inherent right to exist and right to pursue your own liberty. It's a, this is a heavy podcast. These are heavy topics. Yeah. Which is fine because things need to be spoken about, right? That's the whole point of introspective work is you're commuting mm-hmm. with yourself, right? But as soon as that knowledge is gained, it has to be put into action. You have to speak about these things. You can't just mm-hmm. be a hermit through this entire process, right? If you're stuck in that, uh, that hermit stage, you have to do something to really yeah. get yourself out of it. Yeah. You are a creative being. So whatever you decide to do, do it. Hmm. Yeah, it's not good to be stuck in the hermit. And that's the thing is that evil will eventually creep. Say say you're living in a house and there's bed bugs, you know, in your bedroom, and you say, Well, okay, I'm just gonna move into the basement now. That's the solution. You know, you get, you know, a week, two or three weeks of good sleep because you know they haven't found you yet, but sooner or later they're gonna they're they're gonna creep down. Going into the woods alone, probably not a solution because that it will will expand. Same with your psyche. Just take it back to the psychological level. You see something that you don't like about yourself. And you see negative aspects. You see your shadow, and you you shriek in fear of it. You say, "I don't I don't want to see that." Put on the the cartoons, or I, oh, I don't want to see that. Give me the bottle of whiskey. That's what people do. That's how it works. You see something you don't like it. And you you just evade the problem. Technology and population. The use of technology enables the evasion of authority. One powerful example of this is the evasion of taxation. Governments are institutionalized extortion. When technology allows people to remove the control of money from government hands, taxation becomes impossible. Advanced encryption and anonymous peer-to-peer networking technology allow for exactly this. Economic exchanges are freed from the bounds of legal tender and regulation. The future of technology brings the impossibility of tracking money and enforcing taxation. This transition will be marked by violence as governments try to salvage their monstrous rates of extortion. Yeah. What's, what's interesting, this book was written 2005? Yeah, I believe 2005 was the marker. So this is before Bitcoin. He's essentially talking about Bitcoin before it came out. Pretty wild, eh? 
I yeah, I found that to be uh, amazing when I when I saw that marker, I was like, holy shit. Mm. Yeah, you know, the history of Bitcoin is questionable as well. It's sold as this uh, libertarian thing. There's evidence that it's another CIA asset, but that's a that's a whole different story. But again, technology is neutral. The idea of Bitcoin and the idea of like a true peer to peer valued cryptocurrency is a beautiful thing. And back to this idea of technology being neutral, it can either become that if the population adopts it and believes in that idea, or you're getting the CBDC version of this. So it's up to the people to wake up and see CBDCs as they're being sold. That's not about freedom, but a true peer-to-peer network is. So this is why awareness of these issues is very important. So when the CBDCs do roll out, people say, fuck you. I don't think so. I'm going to use my own currency. We this is this is me and my people's. We agree on this currency. That's what we're going to use. So and me personally, I don't I don't care who this offends. Um, this is just about information. Pissing off the Bitcoin maxis or people who love shit coins or whatever meme coins. It doesn't matter. We're not sitting on a fence. There is no fence. I'm not a bit. I don't care. It's about the information the neutrality of this technology. Just like James said, it can be used for the betterment of society, ensuring that you're not going to get taxed to death, that governments can't take your money away from you. They can't tax you after you're dead. You can actually have generational wealth. The product of your labor is there, or it will be turned into what it's called a blockchain, right? Again, words are spells, right? So I'm not attacking cryptocurrency even the word crypt crypto cryptic right i mean it's all there you you can look at it but i'm not attack i don't care what fence you're standing on for what coin what team you're playing on because essentially when you start doing that you're playing it's just the nfl or the nba or fifa of currency you understand that you're putting on a jersey you're buying the merchandise you're cheering for the the head people the people's champions of cryptocurrency so good for you if you made some money Good for you if you didn't. You learned a lesson. This technology was bound to happen and things get usurped. Whether or not it was meant to be usurped from the beginning or just like how um, I believe it was the Rockefeller, one of these uh, programs they sent out, it was a little pamphlet that basically said any any um, organization or grassroots uh, protest you know, group arises, we will take over it. It will be usurped. We will put our people in place. That happens all the time. You can see it in government. Corporations are a part of government. Government officials move to corporate boards. It's all, you know what I mean? So it happens. So again, the fact of the matter is just, it's a neutral tool and it can go yeah. either way. Your yeah. choice. Stop playing this game of putting out um, teams, team ETH, team whatever, Bitcoin, team who gives a shit coin. <laughs> It's about the future of freedom and liberty of each human being on this planet. Every single human being on this planet. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. One more note on cryptocurrency. Like you said, it was kind of bound to happen. These controllers play a long game, whether you want to believe it or not. There's evidence that they do. It's, It's a slow release of technology. When you look at how blockchain actually works, it is kind of, a digital imitation of nature. It's like this consensus protocol, uh, self-learning. It's pr- it's pretty wild. I was big into crypto. I mean, I, I still trade. That's my that's how I make my money. Uh, but I'm pretty jaded by the whole industry as a whole for those reasons that you're talking about. Nobody's thinking about how to make this a tool for the future. There are there are certain communities, but it's become like I'm Team Orange. I'm Team This and Let's make the most money and, uh, of course, make make the money while it's there. That's what I did. But, you know, the the controllers, they have their plan with this technology, CBDC. So when it when it time, comes time, stand your ground. We have to stand our ground. I'm not going to be using it. I, uh, there's no not a chance. I don't care. I'll face the repercussions of that. You and me I'm both. I'm standing my ground. Yeah, I'm standing my ground. And I know that there's more people like us that will actually stand their ground against us. Our numbers are are rising quite a bit. And that's why it's important to educate people ahead of time. Even think it to the, the COVID thing, we're bringing it back. People were warning about this. Alex Jones was talking about 
mandatory vaccines back in the early 2000s. A lot of people were. Even Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner. And if people would have known that this was coming, when it actually did come, they would have known the playbook right away. Before a vaccine was even announced, I was warning people, don't take it, don't take it. March of 2020. I knew the whole playbook. I knew that they mandated at my work. When I quit, I quit eight months before the mandatory vaccines came out. And in my letter, I said, I don't want to be part of a society or a corporation that is going to mandate vaccines. My boss said, no, we'll never do that. You can stay. Well, six or eight months later, everybody was vaccinated. It's it's just wild. So to stay ahead of the curve, right? Stay. It's like looking at the weather patterns. Okay, there's a storm coming. Let's, Let's prepare. Let's get educated. And the same thing with this digital technology. We, we need to be ahead of the curve and steer these neutral things into a positive direction. The American dream. The government of the United States of America in modern times closely resembles both a democracy and a welfare state. It is bankrupt and heavily enforced by legions of law. Culture would have you believe that this is its legacy. It is not. Yeah. Yeah, America needs a rebirth. But then you get into civilization life cycles. There will be a rebirth, absolutely. It's just, that's law. Everything rebirths or is birthed again. Yeah, you can get into the astrological aspect of it, of Pluto. Yep. Right? The, um, what was it, 247 years or something like that? So it's basically at its end cycle. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's really up to each human being there. What, uh, what do you want to make of you know, the destruction that's going to come? And I'm not saying this yeah. isn't a doom and gloom. Oh my God, nukes are going to fly. It's a destruction of this facade, this thin veneer yeah. of a society that you see, right? Whether it's controlled or not, an organic collapse or not, it's up to you for what comes from it, mm. right? If they give you a solution, are you ready to say no? No matter how hard. Yeah. And that's, that's part of discernment is seeing that there is astrological changes there needs to be a rebirth of civilization, but then you're presented with, it's a Hegelian dialectic again, where they present the new heroes of the day, like the Elon Musk. Uh, you know, you're seeing the, the, the mixture of uh, Musk and Trump and this anti-world economic forum as being the new political class. So you have the old world order, and then you have the new world order, you know, mixing in with, with QAnon and, and everything like that. It's, we have to discern which, how is this rebirth occurring is it actually rebirth of the sovereign individual rebirth of the spirit or is it being sublimated into something else it's very important to discern this stuff look at things are changing fast and you're looking for answers things are chaotic you know prices are going up and all this change so people are looking for stability so they go online and then they find these little pop-up cults that provide the answers and then that's you know you're living under that triangle umbrella and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to discern all this stuff. We'll, we'll get more into this later on. Um, There's a quote yeah, by Sigmund Freud if you want to uh, yeah. lay that one down. The ego feeling we are aware of now, the ego feeling that we are aware of now is thus only a shrunken vestige of a far more extensive feeling, a feeling which embraced the universe and expressed an inseparable connection of the ego with the external world. Basically, Sigmund Freud is saying that our consciousness is is shrunken to a point like it's it's a shell of what it used to be our consciousness and and this is the problem that i see with the merger of technology is is these technological aids when the real regenesis is the individual uh, regenesis the bio spiritual regenesis so are we are we looking for further crutches to help our our state of mind our shrunken vestiges sigmund freud calls it like just put you know give me the neural link like that'll fix me you know, put the put the VR on now. You know, I was contained within this hellish world, but now you know I'm in the metaverse. That's not that's not authentic rebirth. That's actually just furthering along the shrinking of consciousness. The final chapter: the end of all evil. Voice is a principle of intelligence. Voice is the highest form of communication between beings of the highest intelligence. The passion and feeling that people are able to put behind their words can change lives and can change worlds. The few who achieve a glimpse of the power of voice bring either insane destruction or awesome freedom. Every great and terrible culture brought into the world was brought by the principle of voice. Every rebellion, 
and revolution, destroyed cultures and empires, was brought by the power of voice. Men who understand the principle of voice have irrevocably altered our world. So I'm just going to read a quote here from Sigmund Freud. Words have a magical power. They can either bring the greatest happiness or the deepest despair. And take it back to the principle of um, fiat lux, which is let there be light. But in, within the Bible, what's in the beginning? It's the word. This is the beginning. This is how we create. We create through expression. The word is thought forms manifest and expressed through the body. There's a quote by Pearl Hurd. Handle them carefully, for words have power. Absolutely. More Handle them carefully, for words have more power than atom bombs. Look, I'm not a master magician or anything like that. But this is the essence of magic, is spelling. It's spelling. It's right in the, in the word spelled to begin with. Um, a lot of our ancient languages have been lost as well. The ancient Germanic languages, the runes, it's all discarded. And we've been given this language called English, which is not native to our blood. It's kind of a concoction. It's a mix. But this is what we, we use to speak and get across these ideas at this point in time. The study of etymology and language is, is massive. And this could be multiple podcasts down the road. Just the power of the voice, power of words, the power of spelling. At the end of the day, we all have a voice and we all have a right to speak. It's, it, we're, it's a birthright to be able to speak and to be heard and to be able to affect our reality, to be able to change and make changes. It all begins with the power of our voice. To speak out when you see things that are incorrect. To speak into existence things that you want to manifest. These dark sorcerers know this. There's a researcher by the name Dylan Sicosio. Highly recommend his uh, series, The Spirit World. Yeah. If uh, you really want to get down into etymology, green language, breaking down words, origins, everything like that for sure. Yep. Yeah, mind-blowing books. I listened to the first two. And you slowly start to feel this spell cast that's been put over you. It literally lifts because the, the world construct that, that they gave you since birth through the education system, through the media, through all this fucking bullshit. When you start to really unravel the words that have been unconsciously bouncing in your head, and when you start to decode the mysteries of the words themselves and, and find their hidden meaning, their original meanings, you'll notice that the spell cast evaporates in your mind. It's, it's, very, it's a very amazing experience. That's what I had listening to uh, those books. It's like the, uh, the magician's trick, right? As soon as it's revealed either through your own discernment or through knowledge passed down, it no longer works. It's no longer an illusion, right? So Absolutely. this works with uh, everything. This control structure, everything, the way the governments operate, the way these Tavistockian think tanks work. As soon as it's, uh, it's out in the open and you can see it with new fresh eyes, it uh, tends to not work on the people who study this and really take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So Spirit World, that series, highly recommended. There's another amazing book that is not too well known. It's by an author named Pierre Sabak. Brilliant, brilliant scholar, and he wrote two major books, but the, the first book is called The Murder of Reality, and he breaks down words in such a systematic, foundational way to see how the, the very construction of what you call reality has been constructed and manipulated by a priest class, very much in line with spirit world. Yeah, and we're going to link everything with the podcast so you guys don't have to uh, send any emails or DMs or anything like that asking for, you know, how to spell it. It'll all be linked. So, yeah, voice and etymology, this is stuff we're going to be getting into in the future, which leads to the next chapter. It's called Future. It is you who will teach the people of Earth their value. It is you who will bring to pass the greatest revolution in the history of mankind. To challenge the authority of evil, you need to dismantle its tools of violence and culture. Culture is dismantled as simply as disobedience to the control of speech. When you speak your mind and refuse to take offense, when others do the same, cultures cannot survive. There is nothing to fear in freedom. Violence is a tool of first and last resort for evil. Those few who will use it to enslave cannot be left alive. A perfect revolution. 
Govern yourself, for this is the nature of an individual. You and you alone control your actions and your mind. This is right, proper, and good. You have a responsibility to defend your liberty at all times. If you do not, it will be destroyed. To yield defense of your liberty to another is an absolute invitation to tyranny. Personal sovereignty is the end of all evil. When every person on earth will defend themselves and those they love, when evil cannot gain even a foothold because all people are watching for it and recognize that it seeks to destroy their value. This is the exact opposite of perfect evil, in which every person is a slave and a master of slaves. Perfect liberty is life, and in it there are no slaves and no masters of slaves. Perfect liberty is life. And to reiterate the point, freedom is first within. I'm going to have uh, two Wilhelm Reich quotes here. If the psychic energies of the average mass of people watching a football game or a musical comedy could be diverted into the rational channels of a freedom movement, they would be invincible. And quote number two, if freedom means, first of all, the responsibility of every individual for the rational determination of his own personal, professional, and social existence, then there is no greater fear than that of the establishment of general freedom. Without a thoroughgoing solution of this problem, there never will be peace lasting longer than one or two generations. Think about that. To solve this problem on a social scale, it will take more thinking, more honesty and decency, more conscientiousness, more economic, social, and educational changes in social mass living than all the efforts made in previous and future wars and post-war reconstruction programs taken together. So essentially what Wilhelm Reich is saying here, <clears throat> that this needs to be a mass movement of individual sovereignty, that every man, woman, everybody on earth needs to take accountability for themselves. And if everybody was to do that, it would trigger uh, mass reformations in, in every aspect. It needs to become a social movement, sovereignty, healing, rediscovering uh, alchemy, astrology, psychology. This needs, to be, this needs to be the movement in order to establish freedom for the long term. Any quick fix solution is never going to work. You may get it for one or two generations, but to have lasting freedom on earth, every individual needs to be completely responsible for their own state of mind. That's almost an ongoing process, man. If you stop, forget, get lazy, what do you think is going to creep back in? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? It's ever going. Yep. You're not just going to plant one seed and uh, forget about it and hope you're going to get a crop for the next 10, <clears throat> 100,000 years, right? Absolutely. It needs to be a way of being. It needs to be a way of responsibility in every waking moment, right? Keeping the distractions to, you know, complete minimum, tending to the garden in reach, things that you can mm -hmm. affect physically in your, your physical surroundings, also while healing multitudes of generational trauma, you know, things that uh, your families have been going through for God knows how long, right? This can mm -hmm. get into cataclysm theory, a whole bunch of other things, right? The uh, schism of the mind, the possible genetic hybridization of, you know, the actual human race. This goes deep much deeper than we're getting into right now. We just want to lay down this fundamental groundwork. It's being, it's being alert. Like you said, it's taking care of the things right in front of you. There's no escape. To quote Jordan Peterson, clean your room. Not just on the physical level. Clean your psychic room. Clean your interior. And you clean... Mark Passio had a great talk about this, about um, stagnation. And it's it's like you you need to constantly you don't just clean your house once and then you're done. You, you need to do it daily, weekly. It's the same same principles. You clean your room. Well, guess what? Next week or tomorrow, you got to clean it again. Like it's it's a constant constant thing. You know, I understand why it's so difficult for the human race to uh, break out of these chains finally and you know infinitely. It's tough being on guard. Right, you have to be on guard twenty four seven. Yeah, not with just your surroundings, but what's happening inside of you. That if you know that seed of fear, that seed of tyranny, anything like that, that can creep in internally. Mm -hmm. You know what's around the corner is an external manifestation of that. So I understand 
you know, I understand the apathy, the, uh, the constant distractions that keep people from, like you said, cleaning their psychic room or psyche, right? It's tough, very tough, but you know, one foot in front of the other, keep going boots on the ground. Yeah. Got to get it done. And the reality is the, the situation that we're in is we're dealing with a haunted house of humanity. I mean, there's so many skeletons within our own psyches, within the body's genetic memories. Like the, the corruption, it's, it's literally like a haunted house that you're going in to renovate. It, this is a renovation project on the internal level and then the external level. So I understand why people are hesitant because they, they open the door, you know, and ghosts and zombies come flying out. You're like, I'm not going in there. Screw that. Like, give me, give me the amusement park. Like, I'd rather go ride on the, on the Ferris wheel of illusion rather than enter into the own, my own haunted house. But that's, that's what you have to do. And it's tough, but it's ne- it's absolutely necessary. There's no way around it. To be sovereign, you need to go in, understand your house, understand your psyche, your body. Okay. Earth. Earth. The cultures of Earth teach you to accept, to yield, and to obey. The end of evil is found in refusing the slavery of the mind. For the end of evil to be achieved, all people must be taught that they owe obedience to no one. They must be taught that the desires and dreams of their hearts are proper and good. They must be taught that every ounce of joy they seek can be had for themselves and those they love. This is the anti-culture to free the minds of people. You owe allegiance to no nation and to no law. You are a being of infinite worth and fully capable of escaping the bondage of evil. When you feel compelled not to speak, speak. When you are pressed by law, circumvent it. When violence threatens you, crush it. You have infinite value. With freedom, all things are possible. Technology, health, wealth, and knowledge are all facets of power. Each of these improve the lives of human beings. The fruits of liberty are everything good and bring peace, prosperity, and joy. You live after the era of wars, and the only remaining step in the pattern of liberty is to answer the question held in the minds of people around the world. The lies of millennia have not stopped the unquenchable thirst for freedom that grows within the hearts of every person on earth. They are poised and ready to take the freedom that is rightfully theirs. They need only hear that freedom is possible, that freedom is real. You are the key. To teach the people of earth the value that they have within themselves, you need only speak and tell them that every good thing is theirs to have. You need only tell them that the glory of liberty is real and that it belongs to them. This war is already won. Evil has already been crippled. Every human being on earth is ready to rise and let the chains that held them crumble to dust. This world will be free. If you can see your own value, then stand tall. Ye are called unto liberty. That is the end of all evil by Jeremy Locke. Man, that was a ride. That, uh, that book is not long. You can, you can read it, you know, obviously within a day, but going over the information that he laid down so long ago, almost 20 years ago is, uh, it was a feat unto itself. And we, I hope we did it justice. You know, I would love to uh, be able to talk to Jeremy Locke, get him on a podcast one time, but, uh, what did you take away from this book and this podcast after going through it? Quite a bit, actually. Quite a lot. I read this book last year, but going over it again and bringing in new material, new insights, and then we've been discussing it as we go and kind of piecing in different ideas. Really, it is kind of laying the gla- the groundwork to understand what is truly good. Like you need to look at that that opposite side. And the main, some of the main things I I took away from this book is not to shrink in the face of of darkness and he i love how he kind of hammers home the points of uh, people having infinite value and infinite worth as well that's kind of the cornerstone in my opinion that's the cornerstone of the whole book is getting that point across yeah it almost seems like everything nowadays you see in modern mass media social media um, even I, uh, at this point, the normie magazines and, you know, newscasts, it's all about violence and you're, you can die at any moment and who, you know, you have religion come in and say, all I have to do is this, and then you're eternally saved. But if not, you're, you're going to hell. It's like, this is laying down 
the groundwork that everything you want to achieve here as a human being is possible. Fundamentally, it could be both. It could be if you want to do evil, you can do it. If you want to be a part of the destruction of evil and live as a, a free human being, a sovereign human being, then, you know, either way, these tools are here, right? So it's, it's, this is very neutral, right? It's, uh, he's getting down to the root causes of things, right? Um, not everything I agree with, but of course, that's being a, a higher minded human being is being able to discern and have conversations about things, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall, proverbially. But Michael Tessarian has a quote, and not a lot of people are getting into, the root causal factors of what's happening in this world. And he lays it down simply, simply and beautifully. Two facets to what's going on. Man's inability to go inward and look, just like you mentioned, that haunted house, the inward psyche, right? And on the other hand, there's this group facilitating that, making sure mm -hmm. man doesn't look into himself, doesn't yeah. find their infinite worth, doesn't find their sovereign stance in life. And uh, listen, you want to call it Bavarian Illuminati, you want to call it the Anunnaki, you want to call it whatever, Bill Gates and his buddies at the, who cares? Mm -hmm. That is something not to get stuck on. It is evil. People are evil in this world. Yeah. And you're ignorant if you think there aren't some people who just want to do evil acts. Mm -hmm. Whether they think it's good or not doesn't matter. It's still detrimental to the entire collective of humanity. Yeah. So. What I got was he was he was laying down absolute amazing facts, um, amazing a roadmap essentially if you want to call it that. This is a roadmap to freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it takes a great courage to be able to look at the haunted house, to go into that dark space and stand within that pain. This is the path to to liberty is and freedom is to be able to stand within that the you know the alchemical fires and, and transform and burn away the things that no longer serve you this is why i i'm repeating this idea that to know that you have infinite worth that once you make that connection with the heart with your soul whatever you want to call it your higher self this pure part of you once you once you're identified with that you'll go through hell to defend that you'll go through hell just to make that come come out into the world right die at any cost to defend that to die you you'll know that within you lies that infinite potential that that state that that soul and to identify with that and to know that that's eternal it's it's like victory is guaranteed you can't stop this you can't put this in a cage no you try try as hard as you want oh you can even you can even end my life as a human being but you did not take me you did not take Go back to the Braveheart quote, you can take my life, but you'll never take my freedom. So fundamental. And once people, people have been conditioned not to see that within themselves. They've been conditioned that you're just this, you're just that, you're, you're just a blob floating in space. You're just a speck of dust. You're a quant, you know, you're inside, inside of a quantum computer. Uh, your life is meaning, life is meaningless. You're nothing. And parents aren't teaching their kids that they have infinite worth. That's, that's where it starts is those kids come in pure. You're born pure. And, and perfect. You are born absolutely pure and perfect. So to reconnect with that and to teach children that, that is the beginning of the end of evil on this earth. People have such a bad identity. People are having an identity crisis right now. Their minds are just filled with so much doubt garbage. and, and misidentification. Garbage, right? They've been taught, you're this, you're that, you're bad, you're, you're a monkey, whatever, whatever, whatever trash. You're, you're, so they, they, they lose, and, and it's confusing because deep down we know that that's not true, and it leads to all these different states. So my key takeaway, that's what I've really learned from this book, the importance of that. Because once you lay down this groundwork and you really start to understand evil exists, so does good, and you know, uh, freedom is possible, then you can start working up the ladder, opening yeah. your aperture, your brain, you, all these things you're going to discover. Right. So this, this episode series was for people who may still have belief systems stuck in government. And this is just the way things are. How could it ever get better than this? I've heard people say that, right? This is the best that we have, right? We've evolved into this society. It, it couldn't be better than this right now. Mm -hmm. I'm here. We're both here to tell you that that's wrong. It can be infinitely better. Yeah. And it will be, but it takes courage. It takes sacrifice. 
it takes your time and attention. The two real currencies in this world, spiritual Mm -hmm. realm, if you want to go deeper with it, your time and attention are real currencies, right? Yeah. So anytime any, I have some people, why, why are things so hard? Why does it have to be this way? Why do I have to learn lessons? Why are things continuing, continuing the way they are? And I try to not interfere much with giving them an answer, but it's always, it always comes back down to nobody ever said this was going to be easy. Only that it would be worth it. Mm -hmm. Anything of value comes with, comes with a price. And like you said, there's sacrifice. There's always going to be a sacrifice. You're either sacrificing the innocent this gets more into the metaphysics of things. You're either sacrificing the innocent to keep what is stagnant and rotting alive. That's kind of a, like the vampiric way that's evil or you're voluntarily because it takes a, it takes voluntary action to die to yourself. Look at yourself, be honest with your assessment and say, these parts of myself are not good. I'm going to voluntarily sacrifice these parts of myself that I've been identified with for eons, perhaps. We don't know. That's the alchemical process. That's the psychological process. And those parts don't want to let go. And that's why it's painful because they're, they're, they're ruts. You start pumping in new energy and, and new, and you start getting the body moving again. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get that flow. It's going to get that flow. But these old parts don't want to let go. So you, but you need to voluntarily, it's like Odin he hung himself. He sacrificed himself upon himself to gain wisdom. That is the path of hero heroism. That is the path of truth. That is the path of the righteous. That is the path of what is holy, what is good, is to, when things no longer serve, you need to voluntarily let them go. That's proper sacrifice. Sacrificing the old for what is innocent, rather than sacrificing what is innocent to keep what is old going? This is the structures that we have now. The parasites, the the vampires of this world, they're sacrificing the innocent to keep themselves going. It's the inversion. So on that note, that's the end of this series. I want to thank everybody that tuned in. And we certainly got more coming. We wanted to lay the groundworks with this book. And going further along, we're going to be delving deeper into Jungian psychology mythology, the occult, all the things that we laid out in the very first podcast. Next week, we're going to have a podcast diving into Reikian theory, Freudian theory, um, and really moving the needle forward with this podcast. And on that note, anything else that you want to add, Andrew? It's just a little bittersweet, right? We had a little talk about the end of the book. So I'm elated and a bit reluctant to uh, end this period of, of our work. There's still way too many people in the world that uh, are under the spells of false authority. Absolutely. Either way, I'm sure our work on the psyche will overlap yeah. things going forward. You know, things we discussed the last few weeks. But I want to tell everybody again, make sure to grab the PDF. That is imperative. Read the book. Pass it along to anybody that you know would benefit from that information. Jeremy Locke dedicated all his work to you. Yeah. So realistically, until the spell of false authority is cast away from the minds of all men, we won't be able to take up the great work. Absolutely. So that means going into disassociating from the external false authority so you can start working on the internal turmoil that is an inner authority, the superego, you know, the ego that's out of control. But alas, James and I are moving on to bigger, more fundamental subjects, subjects that involve the totality of the psyche, the importance of the authentic shadow, authentic shadow work as well. So not that watered down Eastern mysticism cult shit will be citing far greater minds than myself and James. No offense, bro. (laughs) These guys have been around. This subject has been around for 90 years. That real work is psychoanalysis, the real psychology, not the watered down bestseller, you know, New York's bestseller little on every new age person's uh, bookshelf, not that shit. The real psychology, the mechanics of the mind and how it affects reality as a whole. That's everybody. So this isn't just about myself, isn't just about Young, isn't just about James, this is about everybody. We'll be citing the works of Freud, Young, Reich, Michael Tesserion, Lowen, Julian James, an author that James brought up and I'm very thankful for is Ayn Rand, Rank, and Hegel. That's just to name a few. So what I see 
And I don't think I'm alone on this, man. The materialistic world as we know it is coming to an end. And I think that, my friends, is undeniable. So we're ending this series, The End of All Evil. You can catch James and I on Twitter, Telegram, YouTube, and definitely don't forget to check out our official website. James put that together. Absolutely amazing. It's northernwolvespodcast.com. I just want to leave you with a quote. The truth does not care to be defended, but only that it is spoken with spiritual fortitude and ferocity.